Well, we're concluding songs to live by today, and today we're looking at Psalm 13. And uh, I guess if you wanted the title for this message, you could say, Forgotten by God. Forgotten by God. Um, <laughs> the Bible is made up of, a, has about 150 psalms right in the middle of it. Uh, these psalms, of course, are psalms. Songs are psalms of praise and prayer. Prayers to God and praise of God. And I think you've noticed, if you've spent any time in the psalms, that they are refreshingly honest. And did you know this? Did you know it is okay to express heartfelt disappointment to God? It's okay to do that. We all express frustration at different times in our lives to God because seemingly He is not paying attention, at least not the way we want to. Seemingly, His inactivity means His indifference. That's what we interpret. And so there are many psalms. In fact, there are more psalms called laments than any other type of psalm. What is a lament? A lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. A passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And there are more psalms of lament than any other kind in the entire Bible. There are both individual laments and, as a nation, corporate laments, where the godly cry out to God in their emotional loss and pain, telling God exactly how they feel. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had a lament? Have you ever expressed to God disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, your heartfelt disappointment? Today's psalm, Psalm 13, is a psalm of David. It's a personal lament. Now, we don't know the occasion of this writing of David. We don't know why, what caused him to write this, other than the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but we don't know the circumstances going on in his life at this time. But we do know that King David was one of God's chosen vessels, and he lived large. He was a warrior, he was a worshiper, he was a king, um, and he also sinned large, if you consider murder and adultery and lying a sin, which of course we do. So even though we don't emulate all of his life, there are parts of his life that we do relate with, and it helps us to understand. Pastor Bruce Stevens, who's actually preaching in Hamden today, um, and Pastor Brian is in Old Town today, um, came up with a story. It's called the Peach Grower story, where a young man sought to establish himself as a peach grower. And so he worked hard. He invested literally all his money into this promising new venture of growing peaches. And so his new orchard was doing well. The trees were blossoming. But there was an unexpected killer frost which wiped out his entire crop, his entire investment. And so, he got mad at God. God, don't you care that I put my life savings into this? Don't you, you could have prevented this frost from destroying my crop, but you didn't. And he got mad at God. And he stopped going to church. Pastor went to visit him and said, hey, we've missed seeing you at church lately. He said, yeah, I'm not going back. He said, how come? He said, do you think I can worship a God who cares for me so little that he lets a frost kill all my crops and wipe out my investment? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, God, if you cared about me, how could you let my spouse do that to me? If you cared about me, why did you allow this illness to attack me. If you were really paying attention, why are my children behaving this way? Why have they walked away from their faith? God, don't you see? Or worse, if you see, don't you care? For those who do not have faith in God when suffering and calamity comes our way, 
we could just write this off as, well, it's bad luck. But it can be a bit more of a dilemma for those who believe in a God who is a good God. And of course, this gets back to the, the age-old question of suffering. How could a good God allow bad things to happen? How could God allow suffering? Doesn't He see my pain? Now, this psalm, Psalm 13, is only six verses long. And the first couple verses, we see four of David's complaints to God. And I think we'll all be able to relate to these complaints. So I'm going to take quickly a look at these first four verses. We'll, we'll cover the last two in a bit. Um, but I want you to see these four complaints that he has. So let's go ahead and read the first four verses, Psalm 13. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Did you pick up on those four complaints? The first complaint is this. He feels abandoned by God. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever wondered, God, how long do I have to go through this? How long do I have to struggle? And God, why does it seem like there is inaction on your part? David knows that he's God's chosen man to lead this nation. But he's like, why do I have to struggle? Think about the struggles he had. He was anointed as king at 17. Yet he was hunted like a dog by the king. I can imagine him hiding in the crags of the rocks as Saul and his army was trying to hunt him down, and he would just narrowly escape, and he was, he was just trying to survive. He's like, God, I know you anointed me for this role. How long am I going to have to live on the run, fearing for my life? How long? God, don't you see what's going on? And the second complaint is this. He, God allows him to wrestle with his thoughts for a long time. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Do you know what it's like to wrestle with your thoughts? Do you know what it's like to wake up early in the morning full of doubt and questioning, anxiety? God, what should I do? Do I wait? Do I act? God, where are you in all this? Don't you see? Don't you care? And the battlefield really becomes the mind, especially if you're suffering and in pain. You're like, God, I don't understand this. Why won't you come rescue me? How come I am mulling this over in my brain all the time and I can't seem to find any sense of peace? He expresses similar turmoil in Psalm 55, verses 1 to 5, where he says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I'm distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me, and horror has overwhelmed me. When we lose a loved one, Oftentimes, our minds go to this, and we wrestle with our thoughts. I did a, uh, a funeral recently um, for a young woman. She was 50, killed in a motorcycle accident. And I was at uh, leading the funeral. This was just last week, and I could see the family wrestling. God, if you're real, why would you allow this to happen? Why would we lose our mother? 
at just 50 years old and this senseless accident and this pain and just the, the grappling for understanding. This is part of being human. And it is okay to express lament to God and say, God, I'm hurting here. I don't understand this. How long are you going to let me fight this battle? Help me, Lord. And then he goes on with the third complaint. And his third complaint is that God leaves him to deal with his sorrow continually. It's, it seems like there's no dawn. It's always dark. Day after day, I have sorrow in my heart. Day after day after day, I have sorrow in my heart. Have you ever been there? Many, many Americans are there. There's a reason that anxiety meds and are taken by so many. Because we're anxious and we're worried. We're sad. I'm depressed. Day after day after day. And it feels like God's left us alone just to be twisting in the wind with these thoughts and feelings swirling about us. But understand this, sorrow and grief are universal experiences. Each of us has or will deal with loss, grief, and sorrow in our lives many times. It's called being human. Losses are a part of living in the world, both for the godly and the ungodly. It rains on the just and the unjust. And so we need to pray to God to help us. And God knows that grief must do its work or we won't heal properly, and he doesn't always remove that sorrow right away. And then a fourth complaint. God, how come the bad guys are winning? How come the bad guys are winning? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And so he's desperately seeking God's intervention here in verses 3 and 4. He said this, Look at me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Now what we see in this lament and in other laments in the Scripture is this pattern. And here's the pattern. There is an expression of complaint to God, but it always ends with an expression of trust in God and in his future deliverance. And you can see this in the last two verses of Psalm 13, verses 5 and 6. This confidence expressed in God. So it, a lament starts with complaint. It starts with pain. It starts with feelings of sorrow or anger or misunderstanding. But there's always a shift in the writer as they're inspired by the Holy Spirit, in spite of all the pain, in spite of all the emotion, in spite of all the, the normal human parts of grieving and sorrow, in spite of it all, yet will I trust you. There's a confidence expressed in God. Verse 5a, but I trust in your unfailing love. So God, even though I don't like what I'm experiencing, even though I don't understand what's going on, God, I know and I believe that you are loving and I trust in your unfailing love. I love that song. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. In verse B, he said, And my heart rejoices in your salvation. Yeah, but we haven't been saved yet. But I have a confidence that we are being saved. I have confidence that even though I am downcast, I can rejoice in your salvation because ultimately you will deliver your children. And then verse 6, and I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. There's songs in the night. There's even a song in a believer's heart in the middle of confusion, grief, sorrow, pain. And we see this progression now. The progression starts after the complaints, after we're honest with God. And by, you, you could, you're not going to intimidate God by telling him how you feel. He knows it anyway. And he can relate, right? Jesus was tempted in all ways like we were, yet without sin, fully human. And so when you express how you're feeling, how you don't understand, how you're upset, how you're grieving, how you're sorrowful, whatever it is, after you express that, 
allow your mind and your heart to follow this progression. God, though you slate me, yet will I trust you. God, I know you can deliver me out of this fiery furnace, but even if you don't, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to bow. And this trust leads to rejoicing. Faith. Faith leads to hope. We can sing even in the dark because our faith is in God. And now quickly, I want to just kind of, after looking at this lament, these six verses, just kind of unpack six lessons from this lament. Six quick lessons that we can take away from this. The first is this. It is a normal Christian experience to feel forgotten by God. It's normal. We struggle. We wrestle with our thoughts because God, in our opinion, did not intervene in the way we anticipated and help us. It doesn't mean you're a weak Christian or or you'd be a better Christian if you didn't have these feelings. The truth is this. We can't discern God's favor or purposes solely by our circumstances. It rains on the just and on the unjust. And here's another truth. The Bible alone tells us what God is thinking and doing. And God has told us, no child of His is ever abandoned nor forgotten by God even though it may seem like it, even though it may feel like it, you are not abandoned or forgotten by God. Here's what happens. Unbiblical assumptions get us into trouble. Let me just go through three real quickly with you. The first is this. Sometimes we incorrectly assume that God's job is to prevent us, rather, from having problems or to immediately fix our problems. The second thing is this. We assume that God's job is to prioritize my happiness. We think that my happiness is the greatest goal. We prioritize that. At least we think God should prioritize that over, for example, us being holy. (laughs) And the third assumption is this. We think that because we sacrificially serve God, He is going to make our life easy. It's not the case. We get back to that peach grower story. I'm not going to serve God anymore. I'm not going to church anymore because God allowed this to happen in my life. Well, the minister said, well, listen, God cares for you more than he cares for your peaches. That's for sure. And he knows that frost is not good for your peaches. He's not surprised by that. But he also knows that you won't grow unless the frost comes. And he wants you to grow more than he wants your peaches to grow. The Bible repeatedly tells us that the trying of our faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must have its perfect work so that we can mature. That our faith can deepen. So we're looking to get back into cattle again. We've just been little hobby farmers over the years, and so hoping to get some cows again. And I took William, my youngest son, to a, a little cattle thing yesterday <laughs> where we're learning, you know, some of the things about how to take care of a few head of cows. And, um, what was interesting to me, and I'd never heard this, is uh, they were talking about hay and about seed beds. And hay is quite a science to growing hay. And what's interesting is the hay, however tall it grows, the root system is about that deep in the ground. And you can cut the hay halfway without destroying the root system at all. But if you cut the hay or the ground to like 60% down um, from what's healthy, it destroys like 70% of the root system. In other words, there is this cutoff where... If you cut it too short, you're going to ruin the root system. You're going to ruin the pasture. And that's kind of how it is in our faith. If we allow the trials to deepen our faith and to cut out some of the, uh, the misbeliefs, the immaturity in our lives, that root system is going to go deep. But if you allow 
the scorch earth policy, and you just say, you know what, in your lament, you don't come to the point where you're trusting God, you're just, you're done. Like the peach grower, I'm just done. Because if God cared, and you scorch the root system, you, you ruin the root system, you're going to be in trouble. What am I going to say? I'm saying this, listen, even in your lament, don't lose faith. And how is that possible? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to be full of His Word. God is not going to abandon you. He'll never forsake you. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. What you're going through with His grace, you can bear it. When I am weak, then I am strong. Um, let me give you a couple more lessons real quickly that we can take away. Second lesson, being a Christian does not necessarily make our lives easier. The world is the battleground. Heaven is the playground. But this world is not the playground. Yes, God allows us to experience some ups and downs and have some beautiful moments of joy and peace and love and all wonderful things. But it is a battleground, and there's a fight against evil. And sin has marred this planet. That's why God's going to melt it in fervent heat and recreate a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness and no sin and no effects of sin. Amen? That's something we have looked forward to. Remember when the apostle Paul, who was Saul at the time, got saved? And he went blind, Ananias came to him, and Ananias said, this is in Acts 9, 15 to 16, God told Ananias, listen, go to Saul, he is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and the kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's great. You want to be called by God? Let me show you what it's going to be like. You're going to suffer for my name. But in that suffering, your faith, your faith is grown. Your trust in God, it's purified, is, is real. It's real. And in the middle of the trial, there's joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Amen? Third lesson, it's okay with God when we boldly acknowledge our feelings to Him. There's no shame in doing that. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means you're human. And God knows your thoughts anyway. Let your thoughts run deep. And let your words be few. But be honest with God. There's something about trials and going through pain when you express your true feelings to God, but at the end of that painful prayer, you express your trust in God in spite of it. I'm telling you, there's a joy that comes. There's a strength that comes from God for those of His children who express these laments, yet still put their trust in Him. Fourth lesson, real quick. It's possible to trust, to rejoice, and to sing to God, like we saw in verses 5 and 6. Even, well, 4 and 5, eat, 3 and 4, 3 and 4, even when, <laughs> I got a good memory, it's just short, even when we're in the midst of trials. So after his complaining session with God, what does David do? He comes back to his default setting in life. God is in control, God loves me, and God is worthy of trust. Real quickly, the fifth lesson is this. The bottom line for all of God's children is to trust Him. Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. God, there's nothing that can happen, nothing that has happened in my life. As disappointing sometimes as it is, as hard as it is sometimes, that would make me stop trusting in you. 
God is too wise to make a mistake, and God is too loving to be mean. So we trust Him. Isaiah 26, 3, I love this, says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Let me close with the last thing. The last little lesson we take away here today from this. The sixth lesson is be a good comforter yourself. When God brings you around people who are feeling abandoned by God, allow them to lament and grieve. Don't be put off by strong emotional language. They're just expressing what they're feeling. Be careful to say, Christian, you're a Christian, you shouldn't feel like that. They're human. They're going to feel like that. You shouldn't talk like that. Well, again, the laments, they talk like that. But where they ended up is what's important. Even though we feel abandoned at that time, we are, we're never really actually abandoned. Never will He leave us. Never will He forsake us. I'm going to close with this scripture here. In Hebrews 13, 5 says this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Never. You know, Jesus was forsaken, felt abandoned on the cross. He was abandoned, <laughs> forsaken, felt that emotion for us. That's why on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we would not be forgotten. Jesus, our high priest, our mediator, the sacrificial lamb, the one who gave himself for us so that we could be forgiven of sin and our relationship with God restored. Maybe you are lamenting today. I don't know what the loss may be in your life. Maybe it's family or a spouse or a child or health or I don't know. But I know this. If you're in Christ, you're never alone and you're never abandoned. Amen. I want to take a moment and pray for you right now. And those of you joining us online, I encourage you to put your trust in the Lord. Express how you feel. Put your trust in Him because He is faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You that You are a faithful high priest, that You have made a way for us to enter Your presence, God, even when we're hurting, sorrowful, grieving, God, I pray that in the middle of our season of lament, that within our hearts would rise that deposit of faith that you've given us, where we trust you. You are faithful. You are the faithful God. We love you, God. We are grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done, and we put our trust completely in him. Lord, I do pray that you would bring understanding, that you would bring healing, that you would bring salvation to those, your children in this body, those joining us online, as we put our trust in you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.